very much um, for coming to um, share um, about uh, my experience in children and their experience in bullying. Um, this is quite late in the evening and um, the fact that you are here at this time of the uh, day means that how much you are committed to your children and raising your children in a healthy and better environment. So I applaud for your effort to be here uh, at 7 p.m. Um, on Monday, which is not an easy thing to do. And um, I want to start my talk by expressing um, that it is my honor and privilege to be invited by Salama Foundation and share my experience um, and what I've learned about children and their um, bullying experience over the last two decades. And also I wanted to share, this is my first time to be in Abu Dhabi and it's a beautiful and um, beautiful country with amazing group of people doing unbelievable work. Um, and so this is really exciting for me to be here. And also I want to share my background a little bit. I'm a, a South Korean and I did my um, part of the work um, uh, medical school and the training in Korea and also did my advanced training in US. So I have had experience of um, uh, doing the clinical practice and research for both uh, Korean children and US children. And this uh, unusual experience told me that actually children from two vastly different cultures and genetic background seem like um, there are much more commonalities between these children and uh, than the differences. And what I learned from our Korean children that those information benefited children in U.S. And what I learned about the children in U.S. also benefited children in Korea. So I am sure even though I'm going to talk about the data from Korea and other uh, Western countries and I am, um, even though I'm talking about that, I'm sure that those information will be benefited, benefiting the children in Abu Dhabi and also I'm excited to learn about children in Abu Dhabi and those information that I'm bringing with myself to U.S. are going to benefit the children in U.S. as well as children in Korea. So that's another reason that I am very excited about being here. So with that, over the next one hour, I'm going to co cover a couple of topics. First, I'm going to talk about the definition of bullying. And I'm learning that actually the word bullying is not the word that has been used in, uh, in our community here. So this is going to be the first step that we're going to talk about bullying. What it is bullying? And then I'm going to talk about the, uh, how many children are experiencing bullying all over the countries. And then I will talk about the relationship between psychosocial adversities and the bullying experience, both as a risk factor to, for children to be involved with bullying, as well as consequences of a bullying experience in children. And then I'm going to talk about the uh, relationship bullying and suicide, and then I will wrap up my talk by talking about what we can do to help our children to stop bullying. So first, what is bullying? I'm going to show you a video clip that I got from YouTube. So the quality of the videotape is not that good. I'm apologizing to that. Uh, but because it's from the um, YouTube, this is a real situation. It's not some make, make up uh, mock situation. And we're going to watch what's happening here and then discuss what you've seen in, in this uh, videotape. Here you go. Yes. 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 Yes.
It's a short video clip, but what did you watch? What did you see here? Can you tell me? Yes, the lady at the back. Right, the, the child, little child, um, was upset about something, and actually he was upset about his other children, and, and, and then he's running away and saying, uh, please, to stop, but these other children ignoring it and keep doing whatever they want to do and, and making this child very uncomfortable. What else do we watch? Did you see that actually this is a single child versus many children? That there is, uh, this child is outnumbered. That he's running away saying stop, but this group of children following them. And it's not accidental, it's intentionally following this child and, and making this child keep um, very uncomfortable about it. So, what is bullying? There are three aspects of this behavior that makes it different from conflict or fight between, these, uh, between two children. First, this is a purposeful behavior with the goal to cause intentional pain or distress for the victims. So, the perpetrators or the bullies to obtain a dominant position. It's not an um, accidental stepping on somebody's toe or shoving on the shoulders. It's an intentional act. And secondly, there is an asymmetric, coercive power relationship. In other words, there is an imbalance of power. As you saw in the previous um, the, uh, video clip, the child was outnumbered. They can be outnumbered or they can be outsized. So it's a huge child, a big child versus a very small child. Or they can be outaged. In our Asian culture, the older uh, people Older child has a privileged um, position. So there is an asymmetrical power relationship, so it is extremely difficult for the victims to defend themselves, if not impossible. And thirdly, it happens repeatedly over time. It just doesn't stop at a single occurrence. Um, it is happening over and over again. So, the bullying is one of the most common form and well-established, defined subtype of aggression and school violence. Severity of bullying can be um, described by the nature. It could be mild, teasing, sometimes friendly, but it's not that friendly, versus a severe physical attack and by the duration, how long is it going on? It could have started a week ago, or it has been going on the whole school year. And by the frequency, how many times it happens? Does it happen every day, many times a day, or it happened once uh, during the last school semester, which is still too many? Bullying is not a new phenomenon. It's uh, pretty well known, and there is uh, uh, many, many examples of illustration in the generations of the literature. And the grown-ups, when we look back our own childhood, we remember either part of the bullying um, as a victim perpetrator or witnessing it. So it's a pretty common phenomenon. And in our daily life, there's abundant examples of bullying in the child, um, children's books or movies. For example, Harry Potter, which happened to be my favorite book, uh, children's book, 
always studied its first ed its edition by the scene, the Harry being bullied by the whole group of um, his aunt's family and um, his cousin. And his misery doesn't stop there. When he goes to school, uh, there are a group of kids, uh, Draco Malfoy, waiting for him to, s to arrive there so they can bully him. And the Mean Girls, this type of movie is specifically dealing with these uh, bullying issues. Still, you might think, hey, bullying is somebody else's problem, not my problem, or not my kid's problem. But guess what? It is extremely difficult to escape this experience because children can be part of bullying as an active participant, such as they can be a victim or perpetrator or victim perpetrators, but also they uh, witness bullying and they participate as bystanders. They can just watch it or they encouraging bullying by cheering bullies or they're trying to discourage bullying by trying to stop it. And as I told you, that the goal of bullying for the perpetrator is to obtain a dominant position. So usually it happens when there is no um, uh, grown-ups uh, monitoring, but when in, in the presence of other children to show how strong they are. You might think the experience of bystanders is pretty trivial. It's not that significant. Let me share my experience of bullying as a bystander. When I started to work on the bullying, the first thing that came to my mind is my experience. I was barely six year old and I was a first grader. And one day, this big bossy girl in my class came to me with other two girls and cornered me and say to me that, hey, I'm going to bully this uh, other girl tomorrow, and I want you to join. And for the next five minutes, feels like forever, for a six-year-old brain was busy trying to figure out what I'm going to do. I know that this is not right, and I don't want to be part of it, but when I saw the bully's face, and I knew if I say something like, no, that's not right, you shouldn't do it, then I'm going to be in trouble with this girl, and I may be bullied next time. And I wasn't having any, I, I didn't have any courage to say that, but also I didn't want to be part of it. So after struggling a couple of minutes, and I ended up saying, um, um, you know, I think I can't because I'm going to be sick tomorrow. And for whatever reason, it worked. She thought, that's a good reason. She let me go. And actually, I really got sick next day, and I couldn't come to school for a couple of days. But after I came back to school, I had a very, I mean, six-year-old brain was busy with all complicated feelings. First of all, I was worried about the girl. I don't know what happened. Um, and I felt guilty that I didn't do anything about it. And I feel embarrassed that I didn't stand up for her, and yet I am scared about these bully girls to the point that after like 40 something years later, I don't remember my best friend's name or her face, but I remember this bully's face and her name, and she had a little scar on the, on the face, and I do remember that. And don't tell me that the experience of bystanders are trivial. It is pretty powerful, and studies show that bystanders are suffer from the feeling of helplessness and hopelessness and guilty feelings and other things. So bullying can happen in uh, various ways. For the next two slides, I'm going to share another two video clips, again from the uh, YouTube. And, and then you can see what kind of different bullying happens there. Again, the quality of the videotape is going to be pretty poor because it's from the YouTube. But let's see the next um, videotape. 
It's pretty brutal, isn't it? Um, and they're speaking in Russian. We don't need any subtitle. You can see that actually there's a physical bullying. These kids hitting this child on the head. And there is a, a verbal intimidation. I, I don't understand it, but I can hear the tones and things like that. There's a gestural bullying. And we can see the, the miserable pain in the victim's face. And on top of it, it's posted in the YouTube. So it's another type of bullying that I'm not going to go into very detail, but it's a cyber bullying. So the, the place for the bullying is expanded to the cyber space with the advance in the technology and IT availability. So our youth spend a lot of time in the internet and in, in the um, smartphone. So using the text message or uh, social media like facial, uh, Facebook or Twitter and Instagram and all these um, you know, videotapes and unkind messages posted and so doing so that they uh, humiliating and insulting our victims to a wider um, um, audience and, and our children don't have any, any safe haven uh, to be free from bullying anymore. So the next one is something that we might see a lot in the playground. Let's see it. Some people try to minimize it by calling rough housing, but the child who is in the bottom didn't even know what's happening, and it's quite seriously dangerous. He can get hurt really badly. This is a type of physical bullying. Bullying can happen by a physical way, like hitting or pushing, and uh, could be bubble bullying, including um, intimidating or name calling or, or racial slurring. And it could be gestural bullying, like looking deliberately or giving a dirty look. Bullying, when, when the victims can observe the bullying, it is a direct bullying, like physical attack or verbal intimidation. When Victims cannot observe bullying at the time of bullying uh, occurrence. It's, it's indi indirect bullying. This is an intentional act to cause negative consequences for the victims. For example, spreading rumors or turning against people um, against the victims or uh, excluding the victims. Aggression that's used by the perpetrator could be overt aggression, such as physical attack. It could be relational aggression. And relational aggression is an intentional act to damage or hurt one's peer relationship. So why do we care about bullying when people say it's common? and benign and normal growing up part of a child and adolescent experience. And furthermore, some people suggest that actually the children can manage bullying with enhanced character without any adverse 
um, effect. If that's the case, why do we care? Well, this cannot be far from the fact and the, the uh, accumulating evidence suggests otherwise. First, common occurrence means it's a significant public health burden, not a severity uh, thing, not a severity statement. Because things happen commonly, it doesn't mean it's trivial. For example, traffic accident happens commonly, and we don't say that because traffic accident happens commonly, it's okay. No, we don't say that. We gotta do something about to decrease traffic accident. It's the same. Bullying happens commonly, it doesn't mean it's, it's okay. It's a public health concern and we need to do something about it. And evidence, the research indicate, compared to the children who are not involved with bullying, children with, uh, involved with bullying in any capacity as a victim, perpetrator, or victim perpetrators, they have worse um, outcomes in psychosocial uh, functioning. And also, bullying seems like an uh, antecedent of more serious use violence. And lastly, bullying is a modifiable condition, and we can do something about it to make significant positive changes for the children, uh, for the, our children's lives. So now let's see how many children are experiencing bullying. In late 1990s, WHO confirmed, uh, conducted a study in 25 countries and asking children if they experienced bullying. And they reported the results. And here, bullying is defined as more than two times of experience of bullying during last school term. And you can see that bullying is about 9% in the Sweden to about more than 50% in Lithuania. And the victims ranged from 5 to 20%, perpetrator same, five, from 5 to 20%, and victim perpetrator. Victim perpetrators are the ones who are victimized by other children, but also bully other children too. And these children also ranged from 5 to 20%. So it says bullying is quite universal. All these children. All the children from all these 25 countries experience bullying and quite common. So now, the relationship between the psychosocial adversities and um, bullying. And people begin to wonder, is psychosocial adversities is cause of bullying or consequences of bullying? For example, because these children have existing um, some psychopathology, that's why they get bullied versus no, no, they don't have any psychopathologies at the beginning, but because they experienced bullying, they ended up having more psychopathology. So there are these two questions about the relationship between psychopathology or psychosocial adversities and bullying. And some studies examine if psychosocial uh, factors are the risk factors for children to get involved with bullying and reported that the insecure, anxiety, anxious, and quiet temperament and having ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or learning disorder, or stuttering, being short, or being overweight um, are the, uh, those factors uh, increase for children to become victim. And for the bullies, children have characteristics of being active and hot-headed temperament, and they are aggressive toward their peers and toward the adults, and they lack empathy toward other people, and they are impulsive. And physically, they are stronger. They have an uh, earlier onset of puberty. 
and the familial or parental characteristics of the perpetrators, bullies, included that the parents are quite indifferent to their offspring or um, they do not show warmth toward their children and they themselves use power assertive child rearing methods like physical punishment and um, that, type, that type of um, um, the familial characteristics. And victim perpetrators have um, reactive tendency to have reactive aggression and they also have all the exposure to the marital violence and the parental hostilities. And also, children who experience abuse or neglect at home are at an increased risk for all types of school bullying. That's the previous study saying about the psychosocial adversities as a risk factor to be involved with bullying. Are there any studies that examined if bullying increased the risk to have psychosocial adversities? Yes, there are some studies did that. Um, and it seems like studies indicate that victims um, tend to have social phobia and school phobia, don't want to go to school, um, and school absenteeism, have low self-esteem, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideations and behaviors, and sometimes homicide too, and poor academic performance, social isolation, peer rejection, and as a, as a result of experiencing victimization. You might think perpetrators not have any psychosocial adverse effects. However, research actually shows that they have a pretty uh, bad outcome too. Perpetrators tend to have conduct and antisocial and criminal behaviors, and they tend to drop out of school, have trouble in maintaining jobs, and difficulty having any significant meaningful relationship. And victim perpetrators also ended up having ADHD and impulsive behaviors and conduct problems and emotional dysregulations as well as high academic failure and peer rejection. And in addition to these psychosocial adversities, the victims tend to have uh, many physical problems like unexplained headache and stomach ache and other somatic symptoms. So it seems like all figured out, but when you look at these findings, it's about some, something somewhat confusing because, for example, people say that ADHD and anxiety are the cause of victimization, but at the same time, they say that it's, a, it's an outcome of uh, experiencing bullying. What's going on there? The reason is the previous studies uh, examined the child only once. To answer this type of question, we have to examine children a couple of times. For example, if we want to ask if psychopathology is a risk factor to cause bullying experience later, then what we can do is in the year first, we measure psychopathology or psychosocial um, adversities and you know, a year later, a couple years later, year two, we measure if this child is experiencing bullying and then see if it's, there's a prediction. The, my team did the Korean study in Korea and we use this type of method. So we measured children in 2000 and again 2001. So we asked this question and out of seven uh, different psychopathology, the results indicated that the social immaturity in year 2000 um, predicted two times uh, increased risk to become a victim a year later in 2001, and also three times increased risk to, victim, uh, uh, to become a victim perpetrators in year 2001. So it seems like social immaturity plays a role to put our children at a higher risk to become a victim and victim perpetrators. 
What about bullying experience um, and as, as a, a cause of psychopathology? So to answer this question, we need to look at the bullying status in year 2000 and then see if this predicts the psychosocial maladjustment in year 2001. And lo and behold, it did. So the victims in 2000 uh, had four times more social problems in 2001. And perpetrators in 2000, in year 2000, had two times more problems in aggression in 2001. And victim perpetrators in year 2000 had three times higher risk to have social immaturities and five times have, uh, higher risk to have externalizing problems in year 2001. To summarize this, it seems like psychosocial adjustment problem is a consequence of bullying experience rather than cause of bullying, except social immaturity. Social immaturity seems like putting our children to become a victim or victim perpetrator because of their social ineptness. And then, furthermore, because of the bullying experience, these children are deprived of their chances to interact or socialize with their, their peers and furthering their social problems later. Now, I'm going to turn your attention to a specific form of psychopathology, which is a suicide, because suicide is one of the most serious form of um, psychopathology and a third leading cause of death in our adolescence after accident and homicide. We know that peer rejection is a significant risk factor for um, suicidal ideations and behaviors, and school bullying and peer rejection are very uh, closely related. So we want to know if bullying increased risk for suicidal ideations and behaviors. And, and also, we have some of the um, anecdotes in the newspaper articles that after serious bullying experience, some children committed suicide, and we really want to know if there is a real relationship. So I'm going to show you six uh, graphs. I know this graph looks like it's a very daunting thing to understand, but it's actually very simple. So I'm going to show you the trick. The vertical line here is showing that if any dots here, meaning that there's no relationship. All the dots on the right side of the vertical line shows that the risk is increased. On the left side, risk is decreased. So in this case, children who are uh, experiencing victimization, all of the studies, about 30 studies showing that their risk of having suicidal ideations has been increased. It's pretty consistent. Perpetration behavior, same. That most of the studies are on the right side, saying that the risk of having suicidal ideations in the perpetrator, it's not victim, perpetrator have been increased. And victim perpetrators have also increased suicidal ideation. Now what about suicidal behaviors? Not just having ideas, but they are acting upon it. And all the studies that look at the victimization, the children who are victimized have increased risk for suicidal behaviors, attempts. Perpetrators, there are some studies showing the different, but most of the studies showing that it's all increased in among the, uh, the perpetrators too. Again, this is perpetrators, it's not just victims. And now victim perpetrators, their, relation, their um, risk for suicide attempts are all increased. So this seems like showing that um, actually suicidal behaviors are quite increased um, among the kids who are involved with bullying 
in any capacity. But again, it's a bit, um, it's hard to reach a sound conclusion because most of these studies all measure children only single time and also they did not consider other known suicidal risk factors like depression or disruptive behaviors or previous suicidal um, behaviors. So we don't know if it's bullying that's increased risk for suicidal behaviors or their depression that increased risk the, uh, for the suicide. So in our Korean study that we decided to look at this, this factor because we measured the children twice over one year and also we um, measured the depression and disruptive behaviors and other uh, previous suicidal behaviors. This is the frequency of suicidal ideations and the behaviors in boys and the girls and in the uh, year 2000 and 2001. I'm a very just typical person, so I use the pink for the girls and the blue for the boys. And you can see that the uh, suicidal ideations and behaviors are quite increased, uh, quite common from like 8% to like almost 40% um, in, in boys and girls. And the more girls have suicidal ideations and behaviors than girls. So now you worry about Korean kids because it looks like they have a lot of suicidal ideations and behaviors. The bad news is it's not just about Korea. This data shows that it's pretty um, comparable to the data reported in other countries' adolescents. So adolescents have a lot of um, suicidal ideations and may act upon them. So we need to pay attention on suicidal issues in our adolescent. And our study shows that uh, among boys, who are not involved, compared to the uh, boys who are not involved with bullying, the victim perpetrators have 2.4 point uh, increased risk for persistent um, suicidal ideations. And among girls, compared to the uh, not involved with um, girls in, in bullying, victims have three times increased uh, persistent suicidal ideations and victim perpetrators had five to 10 times increased risk for persistent suicidal ideations. This is a serious matter. It's, it's a high risk. So summarizing this, that bullying, our Korean study and the previous all together indicate that bullying is an independent risk factor for persistent suicidal behaviors and ideations. And all the children who are involved with bullying in any capacity, including victims and perpetrators and victim perpetrators, are at an increased risk for suicidal ideations and behaviors, but victim perpetrators have the worst uh, outcomes. And girls who are experiencing bullying are at a higher risk uh, for suicidal ideations than boys. So, now we are convinced that bullying is causing our children a lot of damage, including psychosocial adversities and suicidal risks. So can we do something about it? Can we help our children to stop bullying? The answer is yes, we can do something about it. And you remember seeing the previous slide about the um, bullying prevalence of the WHO study? It studied on the top with the, uh, the Sweden that has lowest prevalence, which is 7%. Why is that? Is Sweden any different, any special? They don't bully others? They are different breed of people? No. The reason they have the lowest prevalence is because they have been implementing anti-bullying campaign since 1970s. And that's the result of their ongoing um, intervention. So then always, 
is the father of uh, bullying research and anti-bullying campaign. And after um, he did work on the anti-bullying um, campaign in Norway, then he moved to Sweden and then implemented that program there, and that was the result. So when he implemented anti-bullying campaign in Norway in 1994, what was the result? Results was more than 50% reduction of the bullying victim problems, and not only anti-bullying program reduced the existing bullying problems, it also reduced the new cases of victimization and bullying. So this was a, a quite an effective prevention program. And then not only it decreased bullying, it also reduced general antisocial behaviors. It's an unexpected um, positive side effects of this uh, anti-bullying program that such as like um, vandalism or runaway uh, traumacy or drug use and alcohol, uh, alcohol drinking. And furthermore, it, there was a marked improvement in social climate of the ch uh, at school. So uh, the, the limits and the uh, orders are in place at school. Children had a much more positive experience with their, their peers. They liked the school better, and they had a much better attitude toward the school. And a similar anti-bullying campaign has been um, implemented in UK and Spain with a positive outcomes. So what's the secret of this anti-bullying campaign? There is not a really big secret. It's, it's not a rocket science. It is a very common sense based, like a good parenting. So let's look at the key component of the program. The adults provide a safe school and home environment that adult engaging in a warm and positive way, but also at the same time, providing form limits for unacceptable behaviors. So those structures are provided. And also, adults provide consistent, non-hostile, non-physical sanctions for violation of limits and rules. The limits and rules are not just there for, for just no reason, but it has to be enforced. And then adults act as an authority and provide monitoring and surveillance of the children's activity in and out of the school. So one of the things that now you're seeing is there is no role for the kids, but it's all adults' activities. When we work on this uh, anti-bullying campaign, it's not children's responsibility. It's our grown-ups' responsibility to help our children to stop bullying. Um, so let's see how this kind of abstract principle is translated into concrete actions at school, at class, and at individual levels. So at school, the first thing we do is do the questionnaire survey about the bullying. How many kids are experiencing bullying? Why are we doing this? There are two reasons why we do the survey. The research is not to propose. First, we want to map the extent of the bullying um, problems at our school. We got to know how much problem we, need, we have. And this is the first step. And we are admitting that we have problems at our school. If we don't have any problems, that's fine. But if we have problems, we got to know how much problem we have. And we need to admit that we have problems. And second reason is we want to know if this anti-bullying campaign is working to reduce bullying. So at the end, we start with the um, survey of the uh, problems with this anti-bullying campaign, but we also end with this questionnaire so we know how much problem is reduced by anti-bullying campaign. If it didn't reduce any bullying program, program then there is no reason for us to continue this program, right? We want to work 
with a program that's going to work. We don't want to waste our time and effort. So that's what we're doing. It. And of course, we can use this data for research if we want, but that's not the first reason we're doing it. This is a very practical reason why we're doing the questionnaire survey as a part of the anti-bullying uh, campaign. Second, we are holding a school conference day on bullying and victim problems, so we reach a consensual overall goal what to do, the school's going to do on the bullying issues. We grown-ups provide better supervision during the um, recess and lunch time, and also we provide um, the attractive outdoor environment so children can actually use those things and play with each other rather than there's nothing to do and just, you know, um, on top of each other and bickering uh, with each other. And providing better supervision during research and lunch time is critical because that's when a lot of bullying happens because there are not much of um, supervision. And children bully other children in the absence of adults because they know they're going to get into trouble. Um, so another place is school bus. bus. So those areas are when a lot of bullying happens. And then there are um, meetings between school um, staff and parents. So we're establishing a close cooperation and communication between school and home. And then the teachers meet as a group, like five or 10 on a regular basis, to share their experiences either success or failure on managing bullying programs. So they are learning from each other. And also, the parents and the teachers meet together and, and um, share um, and actually uh, find the strategy to react to the bullying issues in a consistent and identical way, both at school and at home. Okay. And now at the class level, what do we do? We need to make a class rule against bullying. Very simple and very clear. For example, rules are like, we will not tolerate bullying, period. When we see bullying, we come to grown-ups, including teachers and uh, any personnel, to report it and help, ask help. Very clear very simple instructions. And we need to set the um, sanctions and praise when we follow these rules and when we are violating these rules, what we are going to do. That we are all agreeing upon these sanctions and the, viol uh, the, the praise. And to achieve these goals, that we have to have a regular class meetings with the teachers and the uh, kids and the, and the um, people uh, and the parents. And through the role play and reviewing literature and videotapes that people, the st students begin to understand what bullying is and how the victims might feel. And teachers may want to use the cooperative learning strategies so children begin to develop very um, healthy mutual dependence by working together. And also common positive class activities like birthday parties is good because the kids begin to have uh, just general positive feelings for themselves and for others. And then we have to have class meetings with teachers, parents, and children to continue to discuss about the bullying issues and the rules and, and so forth and so on. That's at the class level. At an individual level, when somebody reports bullying, when you witness bullying, when other kids come to you and report bullying, you got to act right away. You go to the scene and have a serious talk with the bullies, stop it, right there. And also we need to talk with the victims, 
have a serious talk, guaranteeing protection these children from further harassment and build the trust that the grown-ups can and will help those children. And then we also need to have a serious talk with the parents of both victims and perpetrators to inform them what happened and, and also to share the plans, what we're going to do both at home and at school and then have a follow-up meeting to make sure that those plans carried out. And then we need to be more creative um, to prevent the bullying. For example, let's say that pairing popular child with less popular child, so this less, child pop, uh, less popular child will not be bullied by others. Or using cooperative uh, learning strategies. And, and also we can talk as a group um, in terms of uh, parents of the bullies and the victims, but don't mix them at the beginning. It's not pretty when they mix them in, in, together at the beginning. Um, you can talk, have a group meeting for the bullies' parents only and the victims' parents only under the leadership of the professional um, group leader so they can talk about their concerns and their understanding or their misunderstanding. And when they are all prepped with these processes, then you can mix these parents and talk about their concerns and their understandings and their wishes and their you know, plans how to help these children. And after you've done all this work, at a school level, at a class level, or individual level, sometimes it still doesn't work. It happens. In that case, we might need to consider changing the classes or schools. And also, don't forget that these children, if they don't respond to this type of intervention, these children's bullying behavior is not the only problem they have. It's a tip of iceberg. They probably have other significant serious problems like um, some psychiatric problems and also they probably have some problems going on at homes so they need comprehensive evaluation professionally provided for these children and the family and also interventions. So now I want to end my talk by providing some, some cues how parents and teachers to suspect bullying in their children. For many reasons, victims don't want to talk about bullying. They're, they're being victimized to their uh, parents or grown-ups. For the perpetrators, it's obvious. They know they get into trouble, so they don't want to endorse bullying behaviors. But for the victims, there are much more you know, complicated reasons. First, they are embarrassed that they are victimized by their peers. Second, they think it's their fault that, you know, I'm not popular, I'm ugly, I'm not good at, you know, this, I'm not good at that, and that's why I'm bullied. So they feel like it's their fault, so they don't want to talk about it. And thirdly, they think talking about the peer relationships to the grown-ups is like breaking the law that, you know, you don't talk about these things to grown up. It's like a, a snitching or um, just, um, it's, it's not a cool thing to do. And finally, you know, by talking to the teachers and parents, they might get into even bigger trouble with the bullies because they maybe get even more mad at these victims about the fact that they talked to the grown ups that they were bullied and so they might get into, the bullies get into a little more trouble and then they get back to the victims and bully them even more seriously. For these reasons, they don't want to talk about bullying experience to the grown-ups. But there are some behavior indicators that might say that your child is in trouble, um, especially being bullied by, by the uh, other kids. First, um, you know, the kid who loves school suddenly doesn't want to go to school, 
um, and is afraid of school, it's understandable. School is not a safe place anymore, and it's not fun. And um, they begin to have unexplained uh, physical symptoms like headache and um, stomach ache and dizziness, and you bring them to the pediatrician, they cannot find anything, but they kept having these problems. And all of a sudden, the, the academic performance becomes go to downhill really rapidly with no reasons. And you begin to notice a sudden change in the mood or onset of anxiety problems or they have difficulties in sleeping or concentrating and they stop talking to you. And you begin to notice that your child doesn't spend um, much time with their peers. All of these things indicate that your child is having some trouble at school, most likely that they are having bullying problems. Once you notice these things, then you need to talk to your, uh, your um, child. The best practice is that you make a um, routine to have a conversation about um, school life before anything happens. So this becomes a kind of routine thing that you talk about school life. You know, I had a you know, good day, I had a fight with my friend, uh, blah, 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 but also you have, you know, it's, it's a kind of routine thing that, oh, I saw so-and-so was really mean to this child, and I'm worried about it. So in that way, you begin to hear about the peer relationship even before uh, you know, um, your child shows anything. So it's okay to talk about those things, giving them a permission to do that. But you have to talk for sure when you begin to see these changes in your children. That you have to approach your child in a very non-judgmental and supportive way and saying, you know, I know um, it might be hard for you to say, but it's okay to say, uh, and it's not like um, you know betraying your friends. It seems like you're having a difficulty. Can we talk about your your um, relationship with your friends? And it's not your fault. It happens, and we need to help you. It's not your responsibility to stop this but it's grown-up's responsibility to provide safe environment so you can have um, your school days happy and fun. And it's my responsibility and it's teacher's responsibility to stop these things for you. So let's talk about it. And, and when you learn that your child is bullied, then you need to talk to your teacher the child teacher, so they can look for it because it's, it's possible that your teacher, the child teacher didn't know anything about it because bullying happens when teachers don't see. And so now they begin to look for it and be more vigilant about providing the safe um, places. And the teachers are going to make it public about bullying. It's not saying that so-and-so is bullied by so-and-so, but it's making uh, bullying a public issue. Okay, bullying is this kind of behavior. We are not tolerating any of these behaviors. So, like I told you about the school uh, class rules, that anybody who says this, come to me and talk to me. And uh, anybody who is having this experience, come and talk to me. We're going to help. It's not just the victims who need help, but the kids who are bullying other kids, they need help too so that we make a platform for people, for children to come to teachers and the parents to deal with these issues. So with this, that, um, this um, note, that I'm going to um, finish my talk and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. We want to listen bullying at home from you. You want to listen? Yes, bullying at home. You discussed in the school, mm -hmm. but not at home. Right. Um, actually, bullying at home is uh, the same issues. The bullying at home 
usually for children, happens in the sibling. They're usually the older child bullying the younger sibling. But um, also, bullying ha can happen in the adults too. Um, husband can bully the uh, wife, while wife can bully husband the other way around. Um, and um, there, so those things happen, and that has to be dealt with and addressed. When I talk about um, bullying happening at home and the teachers and the parents talk to each other and follow through, it's because the child who is bullying other kids at school or victimized um, uh, by other kids at school are likely to be victimized at home by other older sibling or bullying other kids too. So the same rule has to be happening, applied to home. So the bullying behavior not only stops at school but has to stop at home too. So that's a very good point that you brought that the bullying doesn't only happen at school but as it happens at home too. And by the way, you cannot just say to your own child that you gotta stop bullying when you're bullying your wife or you're bullying your husband. You need to stop that too. And you cannot bullying your own children either. You can discipline, but you, you cannot bullying your children. There is a yeah, gentleman there. Hi. Hi. Uh, you said that you need to sit down with your child and understand where, whether if he has been bullied or if he's, you know. What about if your child is sensitive and he's quiet and he doesn't want to like talk about anything and it's very hard to get things out of him? What, what, what do you do? Well, in this case, as I told you, that they, they will show one of these behavior indicators. That means that your child is having difficulty. Yes, some children have uh, more difficulties than other children in terms of talking about their sensitive issues. But when you're patient enough, then usually they talk about it. And, but still, if they, don't, they cannot talk about it, then it's time for you to have a professional help. Because child psychiatrists or developmental pediatricians or psychologists are very good at helping these children who don't want to talk about this using lots of different ways of playing or uh, puppets and other means that they can begin to talk about it. So when in doubt and when you cannot go further uh, on your own, ask professional help. And just don't let slip away, because it's going to cause more serious problems in the long run. So get the help if you cannot help your own child. And you know best, because you're the mother, and you know the best about your child. So if there is a difficulty, then go ask a professional help. And there was a gentleman at the back who raised the hand. I don't remember who he was. Yeah. Hi, I just had a couple of questions. One was, have you noticed any large-scale correlations between bullying and social phenomena or even anthropological trends? And the second question was, do you have any bullying data on the UAE? Um, the, first, the second question first, I don't have data on UAE, although uh, Kadir, that we had uh, uh, this morning some uh, report uh, at the Sky um, interview. Is that the UAE data? Yeah, so there were some UAE data that it was um, reported in the uh, Arabic language, so I couldn't get it. But there is a, um, if you go back to Sky News that's aired today, they reported some data on the bullying. I think it's not that different. I don't have a specifics, but my impression was the number of children who are having, uh, experiencing a bullying in UAE was not that different from what it was reported in the WHO data. 
as I told you, it's a universal phenomena, and um, you know, from whatever culture the kids from, that they actually have bullying experience in a certain um, extent. The first question about the logical relation. There's not a logical relation studies, but there are some uh, correlation studies at a smaller scale, like the, the size of the uh, skull. The larger the skull is, uh, the more likely to have bullying, uh, probably because it's the uh, supervision issues. The school is large and we don't have uh, many um, personnel there and then there will be some blind spot where the uh, supervision is not um, provided. In the neighborhood where the criminal organizations are, the bullying skyrocks there. Um, Again, it's a learned behavior too, but also um, uh, probably the community where the criminal organizations exist, there are not much supervision by the grown-ups there for the children. So there are some of those data. Uh, just a question, a practical question. As a parent, uh, we have uh, all agreed that it's a very common phenomenon. Your children going to the school. What advice would you would I give as a mother to my child when they are faced with bullying? Like if they are a victim, how they can stand up for themselves? Because we as a parent cannot be 24 hours with them. So how a child stands for himself in front of a perpetrator? What advice as a mother I can give him? Okay. There are several things that you can do. First, you need to tell your child if they are bullied by other children, it's not their fault. It's not because they are wrong, they are victimized. It's not their first. They need to know that first. Second, it's not their responsibility. You know, I told you about the power imbalance. The reason they are victimized is because there is no way for them to defend themselves, either outsized or outnumbered. So we cannot say to them, go deal with it. It's not their responsibility. It's grown-ups' responsibility, parents' responsibility, and teachers' responsibility, community leaders' responsibility. So we're saying, I know that you are bullied and it's miserable and I will deal with it with the parent, uh, with the teachers and you begin to uh, have a dialogue with the teachers and, um, and, and, and then work on it. So um, they need to know that first it's not their, their responsibility and they need to tell you and the uh, teachers about the instance and make sure that they don't have to go back to the bullies and stand up for themselves, but the parents and the teachers will take care of it and go through the steps that I talked about it. It takes the whole village to take care of this thing. And it doesn't work. There are many efforts to try to work with bullies only or victims only and it shows over and over again, it doesn't work. It has to involve the whole school, including bystanders, because if it's not a cool thing to bully others, and other kids like, really, I don't like you because you bully others, then these bullies begins to lose the motive to bully other children because it started to gain a pot, the dominant position among his peers or her peers, and you're not getting it. So the whole atmosphere has to be like, we do not tolerate bullying. Bullying is not a cool thing to do. And not only that, it's a grown up and the teachers and the parents and the community leaders, it's not just um, teachers and the parents, you know, even if not, it's not my child, if you see children bullying each other on the street, you need to step in and intervene because it's everybody's problem. If my child witnesses other children 
bullying, even if they are not in the same school, my child is going to get um, affected. So you need to work on those um, bullying of other children, even if they are not your child. Also, it's not about victims only. It's perpetrators who get hurt by their own actions too. So you cannot say, hey, my, vic my child is not a victim. That's they, you know, my child is, you know, beating up some kids and bully others, but you know what, you know, my child is going to be okay. You're wrong. Your child is going to get hurt by his or her own behaviors. You need to help your child who is bullying others for your child's sake. So we need to learn about this and spread words about these things. And so we have a consensus that bullying is a problem for every child who is involved with bullying and witnessing it, and we need to do something about it. And we can do something about it. Yes? Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. Um, I'm really happy to know me working with uh, kids with autism. And I'm really happy to also add that a lot of schools nowadays have open seats to include the kids with autism, and I'm really proud to see that. Mm -hmm. But what kind of advice, or you reckon any of your experience in you know, bullying, special needs, or not even not talking about you know, developmental delays only, but also physical um, delays as well. What kind of experiences you had and your advices to professionals and to us? Thank you. That's a very good question. So the kids with the special needs are at a higher risk to uh, be victimized by others. But, you know, kids can be very cruel and uh, bullying for the kids who have handicaps and difficulties. But this cruelty comes from the uncertainty. When they don't know about things, they become get scared and then they're trying to uh, be pretty aggressive about it. So, but once they know about it, what autism is, what Tourette's are, what, um, um, you know, uh, cerebral palsy are, and then they understand what kind of difficulties they're going through, then their anxiety is gone. And they can be very helpful. And they want to help their, their peers who have these difficulties. And, you know, these children can be sometimes very annoying because they make the whole process go very slow. They have to wait for these uh, children with difficulties to, to get in line or give in. Or, you know, children with autism can be saying something really mean, but you, even though they don't mean to be, but because they don't understand what they're saying is really hurtful to others. Like these children with the autism can say, you smell, you are fat because they don't know that it's not appropriate to say those things in, in um, public or to others. But, it, you know, it's annoying if somebody says that. But if we understand, the children understand, it's not really because they are mean, but they have some difficulties to understand these things, then children are much more generous and, and understand and try to help their children and also learn how to modulate their frustration with these children. So teach them about the difficulties and the handicaps that these children have and, and uh, when they have a lot of questions and, and, and um, uncertainties, they let them ask and answer them, and, and then um, incorporate them in helping these children. I just want to say one thing. The, one of my, um, the person that I know who has a child with autism in Korea, the first thing they, he does uh, when the new school starts is to go to the parent, parent meeting. And, and then introduce his, his child that, um, with a little snack and then making friends with the parents and saying, 
Okay, I want to say something about my child. My child has autism, and he has this problem, and sometimes it's going to be annoying, and your child might be complaining about these children, and I'm sorry about it. And we are working to help my child, but this is the condition that we have, and I want you to help me to help my son to navigate these systems, and then parents you know, they get a little frustrated here and there, but understand it, and they're trying to help these parents. This is the best strategy. I cannot hear. When the difficult is uh, learning difficult, like dyslexia, is something that it's not so easy to understand for the other kids. Um, normally they think that the kid is just them. You know, y you will be pretty surprised how much children can understand. Dyslexia seems like a very difficult concept to understand for children, but try it. Children understand because they themselves had not long ago difficulty to reading books or reading uh, mathematics. So they understand. That diffic those difficulties, and actually some of the kids have more difficulties in reading books than others. And you know, not every kid is good at sports. Then you can make an example, like you're not good at sports, like that. This child is not good at reading, and this is you know every child has. Uh, some, you know, difficulties in some area, and this child happened to have difficulties in reading. And then the child begins to understand. The best way to do it is direct way, and talking about the difficulties the child has. And, and actually, the children has amazing capacity to understand these um, concepts. In Chicago, there is a school created with the goal to have autistic children um, in the, uh, with the typically developing children. So um, it's about 30% or 40%, 30, 20 to 30% of uh, autistic children, and the rest is the typically developing children. And um, they learn about uh, children with autism, and they are very, very helpful, and they're glad to help their peers who have autistic problems. But not only that, it's, it's not only helpful for the children with autism um, developing the social skills by spending time with typically developing children and learning from them, but also the typically developing children are doing much better than the other kids in the, the regular education school because they feel pretty great about helping um, his peers or her peers who have difficulties, feels altruism, feel good about themselves, feel um, their self-esteem is higher, and, and their, uh, the general function is much better than the other children who don't have this, uh, children in their class. So it's not just, um, doing this is not just helping the children with handicaps or with um, special needs, but also understanding about this special needs group of uh, colleagues and peers, helping these typ typically developing children being a better citizen and being better adapted. So it's both way. We need a... This is the last question. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for your talk. Thank uh, you. Brought great awareness in different areas. Um, through my work as um, a life and leadership coach, I worked with children actually uh, for this purpose of bullying. And I'd like to have your um, actually opinion about it. I, you, because you mentioned here it's all about us as adults um, bringing the awareness and solving the whole issue. I also believe there's another side of it where children can open up to each other, they can see each other, mm -hmm. and they connect heart to heart with mm -hmm. each other. And I did that through circle times where children would gather, same group age, 
and speak about emotions, see each other, witness each other when they're happy about their sharing their stories of, of happy or sad. And that kind of workshop really, I think, uh, uh, raised the awareness to such a high level among these children mm -hmm. where they all of a sudden, with no need for action from my side to say, let's say, you have to do this or that, this is how you need to treat the other. I just brought awareness to the whole group of what that other child felt. And that was it. Mm -hmm. There was no need for more. That yes, point. that's a very um, a wonderful way to help children too. Um, but to do so, the first thing is we need to provide the environment that children can, can, to get, can get together and share those feelings together. And, and, and those things that we're talking about is creating a safe, and safe environment that children can share their feelings and their inside uh, thoughts. And to do so, that we have to make sure that this is a safe environment that you can do it. But that's a very important way to share um, their thoughts and understand. It's like understanding other person's feelings. So if you understand um, that how miserable the victims feel, then there are some bullies who's going to stop doing it. Not all, though. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for your attention.